I don't know where Paula is, but we'll skip her. Hello. Well, it's a good time, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've, um, we're there. Yeah, yeah. But they haven't changed. I couldn't open it until literally like yeah, I got it. 12 o'clock. I already made a copy. Are we all set, Sean? I am. was like, hey, I can't open it. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order. I'll ask if you can stand if you're able and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Next item on the agenda is public comment. Does anyone have anything they wish to bring up that's not on tonight's agenda? Seeing no one, I'll move on. Um, reports from school committee members. Um, I'll start. I just want to congratulate the superintendent on becoming a grandfather. Thank you. Um, so I know on behalf of the committee, I wish him luck. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, with that, does any other member of the committee have anything they wish to add? Mr. Greg. Chair. So I uh, had the pleasure of going to the homecoming game, and I just got to say the new facility, like the way it handled all the people, uh, the parking, they opened the parking lot up for the, the game. So it was kind of nice. But the field, the concession stands, the bathrooms, like everything was just great. So, um, and my daughter, two, both my daughters are in the band, so I got to see a nice halftime show. It was a nice night. Teresa, go right ahead. Um, in keeping with that, just uh, thank you to Mr. Brannigan for thinking outside the box and getting that big tent for the homecoming dance. Um, I think there were well over 500 students there, and they had a blast. My son went, so I just wanted to say thank you to Brandon and all his team for that. Anybody else? Seeing no one, Natalia, I'll turn it over to you. Starting with the MEC. Last week, the MEC hosted Toe Joe Puppet Band, a two-person entertainment act for an enrichment activity. The students and staff had an amazing time singing and dancing along. Last night, the MEC successfully hosted their open house. The staff enjoyed watching their students guide their families through the school. 
Next Friday, there will be a Halloween parade down Main Street and back to the Met. On to MKG, the Middleborough Fire Department came to MKG for a fire safety and prevention presentation for some of their second, first, second, and fourth grade students. They will be back next week to finish presenting to the rest of the classrooms in those grade levels. The students are making gains in completing puzzles in ST Math, as well as moving through levels of Lexia Core 5. And the after school clubs will be kicking off next week. For HBB, the HBB Harvest Big Blast is returning this year and is scheduled for Friday, October 29th from 6 to 8.30 p.m. They are doing things differently this year in that the event will be outside, but kids are still encouraged to wear their costumes and they will still have tons of fun games and prizes. They will also be having a jack-o'-lantern contest and a decorating contest similar to a trunk or treat. Tickets are available for pre-order until October 26, and tickets will be sold at the door. For Nichols Middle School, NMS held their first ever unified bocce meet on Wednesday, October 21st. Mrs. Anderson, Mrs. Mary Gates, and Officer Phillips supported the NMS bocce team as they completed as they competed against Seekonk. It was great to see the joy and fun these students had playing bocce. The NMS School Council has met several times and voted on their executive board. Builders Club has met twice and the students, together with Mr. Redpath, have planned a team cluster decorating contest to take place next week. Tomorrow, NMS is going pink for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Congratulations to the cross country team for working so hard, beating their personal best times by 20 seconds or more. And the next PTA meeting will be held on Wednesday, November 10th at 7 p.m. And lastly, on to MHS. MHS had a very successful weekend last week, beginning with a heavily involved spirit week, a winning homecoming football game, then the homecoming parade, which we want to congratulate the senior class for winning, and thank you to Mrs. Latender and the members of the school committee for judging. And we ended the weekend with our homecoming dance. Congratulations to Tim Johnson and Darius Makowitz for being nominated homecoming royalty. Last night, MHS Student Council hosted their first full council meeting of the year. The theme was Halloween and the council is so excited to start the year. The Unified Basketball has had a very successful season so far. They celebra celebrated their first win last week and two wins yesterday. Congratulations to the athletes for remaining undefeated. Next Wednesday, we have our first home game in the new gym for Unified Basketball and all students are encouraged to come. Anyone interested in joining Key Club, meetings are on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. in C149. On Friday, October 29th, at the last scheduled home game of the season for, for football, sorry, the class of 2022 will be hosting another bake sale and the National Honor Society is hosting a canned food drive. All members of our community are encouraged to bring canned goods. MHS students who bring three canned goods are granted free admission to the game. Any senior who plans to apply to Bridgewater State University, mark your calendar for November 17th as BSU will be hosting an instant decision day at MHS. The members of the National Honor Society are offering a program to all students in all classes, allowing for weekly meetings with a one-on-one -on -one tutor. This is a free tutoring opportunity. Please reach out to Mr. Goldman if you are interested. Tomorrow, September, oh, no, sorry, that was my last one. And then a reminder to all senior families that all senior pictures are due by November 22nd, 2021. Thank you. Thanks, Natalia. Does anyone have any questions for Natalia? Rich? Thank you, as always, for the incredibly comprehensive list of updates. Uh, I don't know if, if, you, if you'll know this, but uh, I was curious. You mentioned the Key Club, and I know I've heard that before, but what is the Key Club? So I'm not a part of the Key Club, so I can't tell you in depth, but I know that they put on, um, I think that they're the club that puts on like the Eat to Heat event. So it's just a lot of like giving back to the community. I think it's like a very community service based uh, club. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. Other questions for Natalia? Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you. I'll turn it over to the superintendent for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, members of the studio audience. 
Uh, my first report tonight is the COVID-19 update, and I would update by saying that our numbers were down to 18 on last Friday's data dashboard. That's a downward trend, and hopefully that will continue. Um, tonight also, we have Carol McNassu here, our nurse leader, coordinator of nursing. <clears throat> this week, a lot of information came out. Last, actually, the middle of last week, a lot of information came out on an updated uh, frequently asked question, and she has prepared a slideshow to review that document and to review where we are. Um, so we welcome her tonight. Paula, thank you very much for coming, and you're on. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, school committee members. Um, is working on right, Sean? Am I? I'm good? Okay, so um, as Superintendent Lynch mentioned, we have the Middleborough um, Public Schools Test and Stay program. It's the updated frequently asked question sheet. We will otherwise refer to it as the FAQ. It was from the Department of Elementary and Special Secondary Education, DESE, and the Department of Public Health. So the first question on the test and stay updated format this week, the updated FAQ this week was, can individuals who are unable to wear a mask due to medical or behavioral issues participate in test and stay? The prior answer to this was no, and the updated answer is yes, provided that the staff supporting such students employ the additional safety precautions described below. I included a summary of Appendix A, which is some students cannot wear masks for medical or behavioral reasons, and staff persons who must interact closely with students who cannot wear masks while participating in test and stay should follow the guidelines that the Center of Disease Controls and Prevention described for direct service provider, otherwise known as DSP. When school staff direct service providers, DSPs, work closely with students who cannot wear masks that are identified as close contacts, the DSP staff are to wear appropriate PPE when unable to physically distance. There's a list of the classification of protective equipment recommended. This comes in a grid format for all school staff that we're very familiar with, with check marks next to all the items that are offered. And the specialized PPE is provided for all staff as needed. Additional questions on the FAQ include, when individuals are participating in the test and stay program, do they have to wear masks when outdoors? The answer is yes. Individuals who are in the test and stay program must wear masks at all times unless they are eating or drinking, including when outdoors. The next question was, for the test and stay program, is there a specific time of day that the testing need to occur? And the answer from the Department of Education and Secondary Education Department of Public Health FAQ is, schools are encouraged to conduct test and stay testing as early in the day as possible, but there's not a specific deadline for testing, as long as individuals in the program are tested daily. The Middleborough Public Schools in coordination with the CIC nurse staffing update, as of 10 21, 21 CIC has staffed MPS with up to four nurses to support Middleborough Public Schools test and stay program. The next question on the FAQ includes, if a pro provider, a pediatrician, MD, PCP, that can be a physician's assistant, PA or RNP, clears a symptomatic individual to return to school due, an alt due to an alternate diagnosis, can they return to school without a PCR COVID test? The answer is yes, individuals may return to school after having COVID-19-like symptoms, as long as the individual is not a close contact. And a medical professional, again, MD, pediatrician, NP, PA, makes an alternative diagnosis for the COVID-19 symptoms, or the COVID-19-like symptoms. After the person shows improvement in symptoms and has been without fever for at least 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medications like Tylenol and Advil. The next question on the FAQ is when can an at-home over-the-counter test be used as part of the protocols for responding to COVID-19? The answer is if someone is testing to exit quarantine after being identified as a close contact or after being dismissed due to COVID-like symptoms, only results from an official COVID test are acceptable. And the definition of an official test is defined as a PCR or an antigen test that is conducted at a lab, a healthcare facility, or it can be 
proctored observed online home test where the results are automatically electronically reported to the Department of Public Health. The next question on the updated FAQ this week was, the Department of Education and Secondary Education Department of Public Health protocols for responding to COVID-19 scenarios refers to mild symptoms. What are symptoms, what symptoms are considered as mild? The answer is mild symptoms. This refers to any single isolated symptom on the list below if the symptom is mild. If a symptom is severe, based on the clinical judgment of a school nurse, even if isolated, then it is not to be considered a mild symptom. And it includes a list of those symptoms that we're assessing for. To close in the final slide, we go over some data from the Middleborough community. This is the current public health data for this week, updated as recently as today from our Middleborough public health nurse, Jacqueline Johnson, BSNRN. Again, this was today, 10-21-21. The Middleborough community case count is 61 cases. Um, she has shared that it averages about 50 to 60 cases over the last two weeks. The overall Middleborough community positivity rate over the last two weeks is 0.05%. The two-week positivity rate for school-aged children is 0.01%. And the community public health assessment concludes that at this time, the majority of school age cases exhibit mild cold symptoms. Thank you. And that's my last slide. Questions for Ms. Agnesca? Mr. Elker, go ahead. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it's really helpful to stay up to date on this stuff. Um, I was curious about on slide number eight, uh, you don't have to go back to it. I'll tell you what it is, um, where we talked about the tests that are allowed uh, for kids to come back. And it was like PCR test at a lab or healthcare or a proctored uh, at home test. I was just wondering, does, do, do, does our district have to watch that or does the CIC health folks, you know, set something up with them? That's completely outside of the CIC program. That's all the school nurses manage that. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Can you say that one more time? That is completely outside the scope of the CIC support nurses. That is completely controlled by the school nurses of Middleborough Public Schools. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Other questions? I had, I had some more. Go ahead. Try not to monopolize. Um, uh, I know that there are questions about the commissioner's um, ability to impose an 80% vaccination threshold. So I'm not asking about that, but assuming we do have to comply with this, how do we determine what our vaccination rate in each school is? I'm sorry, does that have anything to do with what I presented? Because I can write a note down and get back to you on That's the questions fine. that are outside of my presentation. Sure, no problem. Thank you. And some of it might be outside of my scope. It may be more of a school committee duty. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hi, Mrs. Magnesco. Um, so we had 18 positive cases. Um, were any of those um, cases sick individuals or positive cases? I don't have that data in front of me. Okay. Do we know if any of those 18 cases were resulting from in-school transmissions or were these cases that we don't know where they got them? We never truly can tell where, where the cases are. Okay. We, so it was, but with your test and stay now, ha is that happening now? This week we did not have any, I can say. Because you didn't have any, base, it, it didn't arise. You didn't have an opportunity to, to implement any test and stay. Oh no, we, we, we did some test and stay that was the final days of last week's yeah. cases and no positive cases came from it. So no cases were from any contacts, from any close contacts that we were identified in school. Again, I don't have everything in front of me, so it's not viable, okay. but I can That's confidently share that. And so, like you said last week, do you feel like this community or the school community is a sick community or a pretty well community and pretty on par with normal colds that we typically see in school-aged children around this time of year? 
I will say my plan tonight was to stick to my presentation, and I do have that quote in there that I feel really confident that Jackie Johnson, our Middleborough Public Public Department, Department of Public Health nurse shared that she described it as those that are childlike school age have mild symptoms, usually cold-like symptoms. So that's pretty good news. That is good news. So that's your same observation is that they're pretty well kids. That's wonderful. Um, that's great to report. I think it's really important that we keep pointing out that our kids are really well and we're, that's great. That's great news. We don't have a lot of sick kids. Wonderful. So then on your presentation, there was a question that um, for some reason now your kids that are opting into being part of this test and stay have to wear a mask outside. Um, and I don't really understand that because everything I understood was that the reason why the kids didn't have to mask outside was because, um, you know, there's not a lot of transmission outside. So why do, I don't understand, are those kids who are opting into test and stay now more at risk for catching something or becoming more sick because they're outside without a mask? And that was a directive from the Department of Elementary Secondary Ed and the Mass DPH. That was not a decision that was made locally. That was a directive from them. And I, uh, oh, I, I have reached that. out, and I will just say this about it. I have reached out to our regional director for Mass Department of Public Health and asked why that is, because to me, it doesn't really make sense. Thank you. I appreciate that, because it doesn't make sense to me either, Mr. Uh, Lynch, because when we do nonsensical things, it's important to ask why we're doing nonsensical things. And how do we plan to monitor that there's a child that has opted in to test and stay that now needs to be monitored that they have to wear a mask when they go outside for gym or recess? And I don't actually understand because my understanding is that mask breaks are supposed to occur outside. So then when do those children who are opting in to test and stay get their mask break that's outside if they have to wear a mask outside? We don't necessarily do all mask breaks outside. Oh, I know. Sometimes you don't. But... I'm just asking, that's a, you know, that's one of the places they're supposed to take a mask break, but now they have to wear a mask and they're only allowed to take it off when eating or drinking. It's a director from the state, ma'am. So that doesn't make sense. That's not, I mean, that's I, a, my I'm not saying it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. I'm saying it's a directive from the state. So how do you plan on monitoring that or implementing it? We can monitor as closely as we possibly can. So you, you can't because it's not really plausible. We'll monitor as closely as we possibly can. Hmm. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to make sure, because I, I also heard that and thought, is that really every single kid that is opted into the test and stay program, or is it just kids that have been identified as close contacts as part of test and stay that have to wear masks outside? Students that do not opt into the test and stay and are not fully vaccinated are at home under the quarantine. So it would only be those that have opted in. But we just have to, this is a rule we didn't make. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't wanna, um, I'm not attacking it. I'm just trying to make sure I understand that every single kid that's part of test and stay, sorry, I understand it, that you have to say it the right way. Um, if a kid has been identified as a close contact, obviously they're, and they're in test and stay, then they have to wear masks outside. Or if they're just, opted in in general, they have to wear masks outside. No, it's only if they're identified as an yeah. in-school close there we contact. Go. Uh, that, so wasn't that wasn't was really it. clear on that slideshow. That Thank you for pointing that out. That wasn't clear to me. Um, it, uh, to me, it sounded like if they opted into the test and stay, they had to wear a mask outside, which then eliminated no. any opportunity for them to have a mask break. No. This so only during they're ident being identified as a close contact while they're under test and stay. I follow. Okay. Participating in test and stay. Thanks for helping with that because I didn't understand that. All Participating right. does not mean just opted in. Participating means actively identified uh, as a close contact. Experience. That's not clear. So I, right, that's I not clear. <clears throat> I get it. And again, I did not write this. It's directly right. from the state sheet. But I, I think they like to make it unclear. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Then we'll move on. Thank you, Mrs. Magnasco. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you. The next thing on our discussion tonight is of the food service challenges that we're facing, and we did post a notice on the website, but just want to bring this to everyone's attention who perhaps did not see that notice that we have faced some challenges with supply uh, and the supply chain. Uh, and Sarah is going to read the notice that, that did go out to families, just so folks can maybe, if they did not see it on the website, that they'd be aware of it. This is about awareness. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch. Um, 
so our director of food services, Rebecca Bagnell, put together a nice statement that did go out to all the families. And because she did such a good job putting this together, I'm just going to read from her words. The Middleborough Public Schools Food Service Department is asking for your patience and support as we navigate new challenges. Please be aware that due to national food shortages, increased lead times from vendors, and drastic price increases, our menu is subject to change based on product availability. Additionally, our distributors are experiencing labor and driver shortages, which can result in delayed or rescheduled deliveries. Please know that our number one priority continues to be providing healthy and nutritious meals for your children. We appreciate your support and patience as we continue to offer meals at no charge for all students. Your participation helps our program and we look forward to serving you. And again, that was from Rebecca Bagnell, our food service director. Thank you, Ms. Hickey. <clears throat> you also have the next item on the agenda tonight with regard to the FY23 budget calendar. Yes, I think I said at a recent meeting that even though we really talk about budget um, intensely over the winter, that uh, we there's always budget simmering in the background. So I put together this uh, budget calendar for you. Um, I sent out the FY23 budget request documents to the principals, department heads, and directors uh, the other day. In the month of November, I'll be meeting with anybody who needs to meet with me to help them with the budget documents as needed. My experience has been the principals and directors in this district don't need a lot of help from me. They're very independent on that. And I've asked for the budget document, uh, budget request to be returned to me by December 17th so that, uh, for two reasons, so that the principals can be done and go on their Christmas break without having budget documents hanging over their heads. And also so that I could spend that time putting all the stuff together. In January, the administrative team will review the draft, the 23 budget, the FY23 budget draft. And then we'll have our meetings with the budget subcommittee, hopefully pushing budget subcommittee meeting up uh, several weeks will um, make it easier on the scheduling of that so that we don't have to meet every single night for several weeks um, that we can spread things out. The budget hearing will be scheduled for the last Thursday in February and tr traditionally um, I go in front of the select board in March. The town manager's office didn't have a date for that meeting for me. And then finally in April, the town meeting votes on the FY23 budget. The date for the April town meeting is April 25th. Does anybody have any questions about the budget development process or where we're at in it? Cool. Seeing none. <clears throat> Next thank on you. my, thank you, Ms. I appreciate it. Next on my agenda is the uh, MCAS, annual MCAS analysis presentation and I ask our principals with schools that administer the MCAS uh, test to step to the mics, if you would, please. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Ms. Lisa White, Mr. Derek Thompson, Ms. Heidi Latenda, Mr. Paul Brannigan. And uh, slideshow is up. If we could go to the next slide. Welcome to our administrative team. Our agenda for this evening with regard to this report is talking about our guiding principles that we adopted last year. What was different about the 2021 MCAS from any other MCAS ever given. Um, comparing some 2019 results to the 2021 results we did receive. And the question about what's next at each school based on those results. And then any questions we have from the, the school committee and or the audience. Uh, to begin talking about guiding principles, uh, we decided at the start of the 2021, 2020-2021 school year that our focus was going to be more than academics, obviously, was going to be on well-being and safety, going to be on relationships and learning in order of priority. You remember this was a reopening plan that we put together over the summer in anticipation of what we knew was going to be a difficult year. Uh, the administrative team worked hard on putting this program together. 
the abrupt closing in March of 2019, coupled with the concerns regarding the pandemic, required that we focused on what truly mattered, and that was safety and well-being of our school community. Safety and well-being had and always will be a priority, but the pandemic required that we ensure from the moment our doors open each morning to the closing each night, the health, safety, and well-being of our students and staff would be our number one priority for last year and in each year, actually. The 2019-2020 school year ended uh, with us all being physically separated and our models for reopening schools this past year kept many, if not all of our physically separated was still with some kids participating in school solely through remote learning. We had the majority of our students participating through our hybrid option, which meant that 50% of the time would be separated as well. We only had a small portion of our students in our brick and mortar schools for the entire year. All this physical separation meant that extra time and extra care would need to be devoted to foster relationships and to create a community of learners. We know that relationships are essential to learning and therefore we committed the time and energy needed to benefit the power of these relationships. With every student in every classroom and every day, we're committing to ensuring that all of our students have access to the grade level curriculum. However, the interruptions by learning imposed upon the, by the pandemic and our dedication to educating the whole child uh, by attending to our collective well-being and relationships, we knew to the extent which students uh, were learning may be impacted. However, the decision to prioritize the whole child is one that we'll never regret because we are educating our standards, <clears throat> educating our students, excuse me, to be positive contributors to society versus students who can do well on standardized assessments. Um, and I want to welcome uh, the administrative team here tonight um, and hand this presentation over uh, to them in just a short second after our next slide. Um, MCAS in 2021 was not the same as it was in prior years. In grades three through eight, we had testing windows that were longer and later in the school year, much later, some of them in late May, beginning of June. Tests were shorter, one session in one day versus the typical two sessions over the two days. It's far less writing that the students were asked to do, so the writing samples were limited. Students took different versions of the test. For example, in classroom A, 15 students might have taken version one, while 10 students might have taken version two. That's called matrix sampling. Um, and that occurs in every MCAS test, but certainly in a single test makes it more challenging. Most students took MCAS in person, while others took it remotely on a sort of a promissory, promissory note. For the high school, biology MCAS was not counted for the class of 2023. Competency determinations were waived for the class of 2022, and English and math were both held in May, which was a different schedule. So the schedule of MCAS was different. Uh, the entire test was different, and it's <coughs> difficult to compare a test like that with the test that um, yeah, the C in MCAS stands for comprehensive. Uh, and I think we all feel that last year's tests weren't as comprehensive as they had been in the past. However, uh, we do have results, and I'd like to hand this over to Derek Thompson, uh, principal. He's the starting principal tonight, and he's going to start talking about the graphs that we have before you and, and what they mean in terms of uh, 2019 versus 2021. Welcome, Derek, and welcome other administrators. Thanks for coming, and take it away, Derek. No, it's got to be a little bit louder. Sorry. Oh, All right, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, school committee. Um, we sat down and in taking a look at MCAS, we felt like it was important to take the results with a little bit of a grain of salt. I think last year was a year unlike any other. And we asked teachers to do things they had never done before and never will do again. So it's hard, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I think we need to take the results, take a look at the results with a grain of salt a little bit. We have in each building certainly unpacked the results, but I think when we got together as a team, we thought it made more sense to ask ourselves the question, did the model that we implement last year make sense? Did it work for us? And I think overall, um, that answer is yes. And so our presentation tonight, each of us are going to go through a little bit about what the next steps are for our building. But we did put together three graphs for you to take a look at tonight. And what you see in the graph here in the first one is the results of English language arts. And what we did was we compared each school to the state. 
in 2019, which was the last year we had results, and then in 2021. And as you can see here in ELA, especially, we actually gained ground um, in most areas across the board um, in terms of our performance compared to the state. So I think it speaks to um, the model that we implemented. Certainly wasn't the case in all areas as we jumped to math. Um, you know, we were at the elementary school further ahead of the state than we were. Um, Mrs. White and I have talked about this a lot, and I think part of the results of that um, certainly speaks to what we need to do for professional development moving forward. Uh, we've been a little bit heavy in um, professional development for literacy, but um, overall in both the middle school and the high school, um, they continued to make gains as compared to the state. Um, and then in science, um, we either held steady or uh, made gains there as well. So I think the essential question we were asking ourselves as administrators was, did the model we implement, that hybrid model where we had teachers basically working with kids all day, did it, did it work? Um, and I think the answer was yes. I think we all felt pretty proud. It was a pretty big ask of all the teachers. I know from my kids who don't go to school in Middleborough, they were on their own for three days a week two days a week, depending on which week we were in. So they just had a packet of work. Our kids in Middleborough were dialed in with a teacher all day. And um, I think pretty proud of the work that we did and proud of the work that the teachers did as well. Um, jumping to HBB, I think the essential question is what is next? I hope no one thinks that we don't take the results of MCAS seriously um, because we made the comment that we're taking with a grain of salt. We are very focused on trying to get the kids back to where they need to be. This isn't gonna be something that we're doing for one year. I think this is gonna take many, many years to get kids back to where they were in terms of level of achievement. And so I know at HBB, a big part of the conversation is focusing on what's important. Um, and first and foremost, so this doesn't say this in my slide, is focusing on the social emotional well-being of the kids. We have kids all the way up in third grade that have really never had an in-person school experience up to this point. We have kids that didn't have kindergarten and first and second grade consisted of being remote or being home. So we're really slowing things down a little bit in terms of getting kids ready and practicing things that maybe a third grade teacher doesn't normally have to practice with kids. And I think all the schools are experiencing that and going through that. Um, so at HBB, one of the things that we're doing is spending a lot of time assessing kids. We're pretty much through that window right now. We use the benchmark assessment system in reading. We use STAR 360, early literacy, math, and reading. Um, and we also implement an SEL screen or social emotional screen to see which kids we should be concerned about. And we're using that data to really plan out what we need to do moving forward, where our kids are at. Uh, we call that progress monitoring. Our goal is to make sure that all of our kids are making progress across the board, regardless of where they're performing at. And one of the things that we've been doing in my school that I think is a little bit unique and has been a pretty cool exercise is um, well, we've been calling it norming, but I don't think that's really the right word. Maybe calibration is a better word for that. But we've been taking the results of, say, the benchmark assessment system, which is a reading assessment, and we take all the kids in second grade. And if they're normally coming in at second grade at a certain level, but we see that 50% of our kids are reading at a level that might be lower than we typically see. Um, that's not call for intervention. That's call for our core instruction to change, that we need to change what we're doing in the classroom every day so that we're meeting those kids' needs. If, we, if our SEL screener shows that 40, 50% of the kids are elevated in behavior in fourth grade, that gives us information that every day in our core instruction, we need to be doing something different in the classroom. So we've been having a lot of those conversations trying to tease out which kids we really should be concerned about, and which kids it's just they're a little bit behind because of the situation that we've just come off of. So that being said, as we are identifying kids that are struggling and need some help, we continue. And this was all outlined in our school improvement plan that we presented in the spring. There were no surprises to us when we got the MCAS results. We knew what we were walking into this year. Um, so we're continuing with our walk to learn, small group, and after school interventions for kids that need it. Um, we're continuing to train teachers so that core instruction is really strong and tight and doing things like in third grade where we might not do as much reading foundational work, but we recognize that kids are 
they need more of that phonics. They need more of that reading foundational work. Our coaches are going in there and really working with those third grade teachers to make sure that they have everything they need to keep the kids where they need to be. Uh, we've done some work to revamp our child study team to make it a little bit more accessible. Child study team is where teachers bring kids if after on their grade level team and in their classroom, they don't know what to do. There's a team um, that consists of administration, coaches, interventionists that we're all sitting down and really unpacking that individual kid and developing a plan. And then just continuing with the tier three interventions that we have a place like reading recovery, which that's our more intensive interventions for our kids that are not showing progress the way we would like. So again, the goal is progress for all students. Derek, before you pass the ball, could you just explain briefly for the school committee and the benefit of the audience, what tier one, tier two, and tier three are when you're talking about three tiers? Yeah, so um, when we talk about RTI, we break it up into three tiers, like Mr. Lynch said. Tier one is, I guess if you're looking at it, it's like roughly 80% of your students. Um, and that, we call that our core instruction. So. Um, that's like every kid walks into the classroom, they're guaranteed that they're going to get differentiated instruction. We're going to give assessments. We're going to target the kids. If they're struggling, we're going to make sure that they're targeted for certain small groups. We're working towards meeting kids where they are at. So our tier instruction has all those components in place. So we've worked hard over the years to make sure that that happens in every subject in every classroom. Tier two is when Kids are starting to struggle. They're not making the kind of progress that we want to see. We give extra interventions. So that could happen in the classroom. The teacher pulls extra small groups. They might work with them creatively throughout the day. We also have a walk to learn block where we have extra sets of hands on available. So they'll provide extra interventions to kids at that time. And then tier three is should be a very, very small portion of our kids. And those are the ones who need the most intensive interventions that we have in the building. That would be like reading recovery, right? Three to five percent of the kids. So thank you. No problem. Oh, good. Can you hear me? Again. Sorry. Um, the, you mentioned intervention quite a few times, which is fantastic. But have we hired uh, intervention staff in addition to what we are, who we already have in in house this year? No. Or is, has that not been done? No, I, and I'm not sure what luck we would have doing that, honestly. I think when you heard about food services, you try to go out to eat. Do, we're facing the same thing, having sure. a hard time finding ESPs, support in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. um, no, we, it's about, you know, years ago, we revamped our schedule at HBB. You know, your kids were in the school at the time, and we did a lot of that work. And it, the goal was to m make sure that we got every bit of resource that we could out of the staff in terms of availability and providing interventions to kids. A big part of our professional development has been about strengthening that tier one instruction so that we don't mm -hmm. um, have kids falling off and not making gains. And teachers have the skill set they need and they have the tools and the resources that they need. Um, so, you know, no, we haven't hired extra people. I, I don't know that we need to right now, but. Um, okay. Thank you. This is Lisa White, principal of MKG. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Mary Kay Good. And what's up next for us? So as Mr. Thompson said, you know, we have the luxury of being neighbors, and we do a lot of the same things. And I, I, we are very proud to say it doesn't matter which elementary school your child attends in Middleborough, they get the same high-quality education, and that's so important. Um, so as we go right back to intervention block, we set up a, I know, sorry, uh, we do interventions all day, but we did set aside a 30 minute uninterrupted block. Um, for most grades, it's first thing in the morning on fifth grade is a little bit different, but we are using Lexia and ST Math and targeted small groups during that time. The Lexia and the ST Math not only allow for intervention, but it also allows for students that um, are may not need interventions and may be excelling and it's very individualized and it allows for children on the other end that are excelling to continue to work at that pace. Um, we're really proud of our numbers right now in ST Math. The kids are, they love GG and they love, it, it's been amazing this year. But it also allows teachers time to rotate and take small groups for real intensive um, instruction that students need 
during the day. We do it in small groups in guided reading, we do it in guided math, and this, inter this block really goes even deeper than that. <clears throat> We're implementing this year coaching cycles. We have um, a literacy coach in first and second grade. We have literacy coach in three through five. We also have a special education coach this year. And they're working with, um, not only with the students and in, in interventions, but also with the teachers. And teachers are working with them in cycles of four and six weeks that the coaches are able to go in, they're able to observe the instruction, they're able to help the teachers with, you know, provide even better instruction and professional development right on the spot, right on that, you know, right in the classroom or, you know, a, a pre-observation, an observation, a post-observation on how we can strengthen the instruction in the classroom. Uh, we also have our professional learning communities, our PLCs, and it's focused on data to drive the whole class, the small group, and the intervention instruction with SEL, with our, our English language learners. Um, we really have that those deep conversations with data, which then, of course, also leads to our child study team. And what, that's the next level of what other interventions or what other supports. It may be a support from the Family Resource Center that comes from that information or that data that comes out of that. And it's really we're looking at case studies, and we're really diving deep into writing this year. And we're looking at the data in a very different way, actually, than we did before, because we're looking at you know, where we're coming, as Mr. Thompson said, the, the kids are coming to us a little different this year. And we need to know what, what's in front of us. It's very different than it's, and than it's been, but we need to meet their needs. And that's, that's the key through all of this. In grades one and two, our focus, we have two focus areas because it changes mid-year for our, our little guys. Um, at the beginning of the year, we're really launching our phonics and word study. And then mid-year, around the January, we're, we're moving to more writing. We know that we need to focus on writing. We know that year after year, that tends to be an issue for us. We didn't see it as much. There wasn't as much writing on the MCAS test this year, but we know it. We know it because we see it every single day. Um, in grades three through five, the focus is writing across all content areas. And we've already begun that work. We've already begun our, our beginning of the year assessments in writing to and, and we're going to continue those and look at those throughout all grade levels, not only in your specific grade level, but what's above, what's below, what's expected at each grade level. A third grade teacher needs to know what's expected above and below them to get their students ready as well. I'm very excited that we have our mystery science kits. You know, hands-on science was not something we could do last year. We couldn't share our materials. Um, we're at a different place now, and we're really excited to be back using our hands-on science. We know that some kids learn best that way, and that's critical for our kids. We are back using our, we, we really got deep in our character strong last year, and our, our, our students really like that. And our common choice, we look forward to starting that um, after the new year. We have several staff members, including Mr. Thompson and I, or, who are taking a class in common choice uh, with mindfulness right along with our teachers, which is nice to kind of be at that level and working with them in this in this area. We're looking forward to starting our after school intervention supports in ELA and math. Again, for students that may need a little extra something, um, you know, even after school to move oops, to move them, um, you know, to where we need to be. But I, you know, we're really hopeful. We were really hopeful in in the numbers that we saw. You know, it, there, weren't, there weren't any surprises. Um, I think you know, it's looking at the beginning of the year data is is a little. You know, take a deep breath because it's about relationships right now. As Mr. Thompson said, some of these kids haven't been in school for a long time or have had interrupted learning. And, you know, building these routines and building these rituals and building, you know, back, building that back, building those relationships back are key for our kiddos. You know, we might have to kind of take, take a pause, you know, in order to take that big step forward. But, you know, like building a house, if you're not on a strong foundation and you start putting those boards up, it's not going to work. So it's best to, you know, get a good foundation and before you start the building. And I think that that we're all in the same. We, we've been talking about it now for weeks, and you know, proud to be part of this team that we all agree with that. And it's it's awesome to see. Thank you, Mrs. White. Any questions for Mrs. White at this point? Moving on to Mrs. Heidi Latender. Welcome, Heidi. Good evening. Thank you for having me tonight and giving me the opportunity to talk about all the great things that we're doing at Nichols Middle School. We've had a lot of changes take place in the past couple of years. And yes, that focus on um, well-being and social skills and adjustment to school has been a big priority for all of us. I would say our eighth grade students, this is their first year that they would be in school full year at the Nichols Middle School because their sixth grade year was cut off. The seventh grade year, we all know what that looked like. 
and uh, this year they're all back together. And it's nice to see that students are working together in groups up to 15 minutes tops <laughs> um, for that contact tracing piece. And then there's more socialization in the cafeteria, which is huge. To, it's huge for the students' well-being, but it's also just great to see for a change. I felt like we were so isolated and regimented last year with the protocols that were in place. Um, as you are already aware, most of you, that we are implementing the Leslie Literacy Model that the elementary schools have implemented in the past few years. Natalie LaPeria is our literacy coach. Uh, with some creative adjusting of staff last year, I was able to have that position um, in place at our school, which has been hugely beneficial. Natalie does teach a couple ELA classes in sixth grade. Our class size is a bit higher there than it is in seventh and eighth grade. But she's also able to coach and uh, support all of our ELA teachers. And I will tell you, it's so refreshing and wonderful to walk through our classrooms and see all the different reading and learning and different types of instruction that is going on. And I commend our ELA department because they were very nervous and anxious because they really are throwing away a lot of what they used to do and trying something new. And it's great to see. And our students are really engaged and enjoying um, ELA and literacy. And it was so nice to walk into a classroom last week and they were reading, each reading their individual chapter book of their own and literally actually reading, not just flipping the pages. <laughs> um, and the teacher was sitting there reading with them her own book. Um, it was, it's just refreshing, I have to say. If you were in our buildings last year, you would understand. But we're really working on building um, our classroom libraries, building our variety of differentiated level text that students have access to. Um, typically, we had you know five or six books or journals or novels or what have you that the students read at each grade level. We're really throwing that out and uh, using some of it, not all of it, but really changing the way we teach um, English language arts to our students at the middle school. We're bu building in a lot of the differentiated reading opportunities, as I just mentioned. Um, and we have a program called Newsella or News ELA, um, and it provides differentiated leveled articles. So if teachers are reading about the Holocaust, for example, um, they can pick articles at different reading ability levels for students to read. If you go into a typical science or social studies class, and social studies full of literature, big vocabulary, content words, and if students are reading at a different level and the content is not really accessible to some of our students just because of the vocabulary, um, I'm trying to open their eyes as our content teachers to understand what different reading levels <coughs> look like and what those are and how that impacts the students in their classroom in front of them every day and how to use different resources so that the content is um, more accessible to all students, which ties right into our differentiation. Uh, so we're intentionally working to define what tier one and best practices look like across Nichols Middle School. And it's about being consistent and having a common understanding, common language of what tier one practices should look like and what it is in our school. Um, that is the foundation, as Lisa mentioned and uh, Mr. Thompson mentioned about tier one. Um, we're just, my goal is really to streamline that we all have a common understanding of what that looks like in our school. We are implementing um, Lexia, and that's helping to support some of our gaps in word study and comprehension and grammar. But we're also going to be taking a, a deeper look into the data that provides us along with the common assessments that each department has been working on and creating. I know in our math department, because of COVID and various reasons and lack of skills and some of the common you know, addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication, some of our students don't own those skills uh, with fluency. And we're doing dipstick assessments just to see where they're at, how fluid they are with their understanding and those skills. And they're using those common assessments to determine how do I best build this into my current instruction, but also teach my grade level standards that I need to teach. So we're using all the different data points um, and you know your everyday observations and really trying to move our students forward and still expose them to those grade level standards. But we do need to meet students where they're at. And we're trying to figure out how to build in that response to intervention, that RTI. The middle school looks very different and the secondary schools look very different when it comes to RTI um, opposed to elementary school. And it's about how do we use the time that we have to build that in within the content areas 
that we already have and using our extension block to better support students in whatever areas they're struggling or even um, pushing our students forward who need additional um, challenges. So we're also building in frequent writing opportunities across content areas. I feel like we need to do more writing um, just based on my observations. And I know last year was not a typical year at Nichols Middle School or any of our schools for that matter. Um, but we're really working to build our students' writing stamina back. When you look at our data from the MCAS, you know, our writing scores were not great at all, unfortunately. But students, you know, for many different reasons, to sit and write and they're at home and then get feedback. It just was a whole different model for just trying to learn and stay focused. It was hard enough for students just to stay engaged from a virtual setting, never mind trying to write, you know, five paragraphs and while sitting at home. Um, so we all can imagine all the different scenarios that made learning a challenge for everybody and even teaching a challenge last year. And another big goal for me is really to educate our, our teachers on the different reading levels and understand what that looks like, which I did mention. So we do have our special needs support um, personnel, a new staff member this year who's been instrumental in really going into classrooms and supporting a lot of our new special ed teachers and some of our veteran special ed teachers and looking at student work and looking at how do we better co-teach, co-plan and um, provide co-teaching within our classrooms and provide direct explicit instruction based on the goals that the students have on their IEP. So we have a lot going on, a lot of, a lot of changes. Um, staff have been amazing. They're really stepping up to the challenges. If last year wasn't challenging enough, <laughs> um, I think they're, they're doing great and we're moving forward and uh, I'm looking forward to see what the, the next few years bring for us at Nichols Middle School. So, um, Thank you, Mrs. Latanda. Any questions from the committee? As we move on to Mr. Branning, and I just want to point out that the last couple of years have been really busy at the Nichols Middle School. Um, Heidi Latanda has really stepped up and stepped in, made a lot of significant changes. If you noticed, you saw the scheduling that happened this summer, the last two summers, and making tweaking changes, periods are longer. Um, and, and there's more work going in to what's going on in the everyday. And uh, it's just, it's been amazing. The Leslie Literacy Model has been a real change and will be a positive change in the future. As you know, the ELA scores at Nichols have been down in the past and, and uh, she recognizes that, the staff recognizes that and they're doing everything they can to bring that up, which includes the adoption of the Leslie Literacy. So new schedules, longer periods, Leslie Literacy, a lot going on at Nichols Middle School and, and uh, Heidi, Mrs. Latent has made some significant changes at the school, so thank you for that. Mr. Paul Brannigan. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, it's really um, great to be able to share with you some of the highlights of the high school. And um, I think I really echo what the other principals have shared of just how incredibly proud I am of the faculty and the teaching staff and the support staff here in this building. Um, especially if you go back to 2019, that was the very first year of us taking the next generation MCAS test because we had always been the legacy test. So for English and math in our first year of, of MCAS under the next gen exam, we ended up not having the exam in 2020. So in 2021, with the complexity of the schedule at the high school, the combining of honors and college preparatory in the same classes, that there was a lot of uncertainty of really what it would look like. And on top of that, that the state kept changing the dates of when MCAS at the high school level would take place. So when you saw that our schedule became that in May, you had one week of all of our sophomores testing in English, and then the week after that testing in math, that is really not kind of how the testing protocols had always been at the high school. So to be able to um, be able to see where our schools landed, um, we were quite pleased um, considering. Um, and really, I think what you see in all of the schools and especially at the high school, it's a lot of progress monitoring. It's dipsticking going back in and looking at really where were, did, where were their kind of weaknesses and really also the fact of really looking at where our students are at. And you'll notice the fact it's the continuation of the development of analyzing our common assessments across the content areas. Um, so it's really taking, um, it, that's always a work in progress because you're taking these common assessments and you're tweaking them and you're molding them based upon really what information you're looking to find on our students. But then also it's the data that's collected. So you're looking at your English um, language arts data that comes in and how can that be not only used in English, but it's also being used in history to be able to see what are those entry points that could be there that's going to only enhance really the skills that we want our students to know 
conversely, you're taking your math data and how can that be transferred into the sciences as well to really make sure the fact that if there's elements that can be spread across the content areas, that it's not just um, a task of English language art or a task of mathematics. And it's also then taking those assessments and it's taking those data points and really how does it drive our instructional practices that um, our teachers have been really tremendous about changing the script in so many ways in the last year of really how were they teaching and, and engaging our students during the last, last 18 months. But now taking all of that and shifting those instructional practices back into really where we are now. Um, looking at really the, the structured entry points to meet where our students are at. And that is something that we've been working really hard at, of really looking at our students. I'll take our ninth graders. Um, the last, as Heidi had mentioned about the eighth graders, their last full year, their real true full year in the building is this year. Our ninth graders, their last year of a, of, of, of for lack of better, a normal year of school, there were sixth graders. So it's really looking at these ninth graders and meeting them where they're at. And we are in the process of, of really taking a focus group of teachers. We had done a protocol back in, in September of really looking at all of our ninth graders and to see what are we seeing in them? What are the skills that they have that are really strong, but conversely, what are the skills that we're seeing that they're really absent of that normally in a ninth grade, grade ninth grader you would see? To then be able to put together these focus groups to really say, how can we infuse those skills into our ninth grade classes that normally they have come in with as well? Um, and then also looking at the implementation of strategies to support students in only the production of writing, but the distribution of writing. I think you see the trend across all the schools of really this, this um, focus on writing and the stamina of writing as well. And that is something that, especially in our English language arts and history, you'll see that focus. And as well as really looking at our pacing guides, especially in mathematics, of really looking at our ninth graders in Algebra 1, but also our geometry students as well, based upon those data points, what are the tweakings that we need, tweaking that we need to do in order to make sure we're meeting the needs of the students as well. We've realigned department meetings to make sure they're more consistent in terms of re meeting back to back. So the departments met today and they'll meet again next Thursday as well to be able to allow momentum to begin of really looking at what are the changes that need to be made or tweaks in curriculum? What are those changes in instructional strategies and guides that need to be done to allow for that momentum to keep going of really looking at that data points that are coming in? As you've heard, a lot of the tier one interventions and in RTI, the, the tier one interventions at the high school of really, how do we define that? How, what are those entry points again of, that we're looking at? Um, and really in terms of our classes, in our algebra classes, in our geometry classes, in our math strategies courses, it's really taking our data points and really what do we need to kind of infuse into these courses that potentially we didn't have to do that in the past. And namely also in English as well. And our ninth grade program and our 10th grade program, going back and looking at the rising ninth grade is what did their eighth grade data look like? And what does that tell us in terms of what we need to fill in for those students? Um, and even in science where we didn't have reported data, um, our, our eighth grade, excuse me, our current um, sophomores, they did take the MCATS test and you'll see their data reports next year after English and math are done for them. But one of the interesting parts is, is that almost 86% of our students actually passed the biology MCAS test, which we were quite pleased with. But now looking at really how do we get students caught up to make sure the fact that they're ready for any student who has to retest, um, that our boot camp is being brought back again. And we were so fortunate last year of being able to run the boot camp for biology, where we had a team of biology teachers come together and really take all of the standards in the February exam that our students potentially did not meet and really ensured the fact that we could hone in on those standards in particular to make sure when they retested in June, the fact that they could um, potentially and hopefully meet with success. And then lastly, it's just really some very intentional focus on really bringing back in the stamina of our students. Um, we know the fact that for many of our students here at the high school, it's about by the time they hit noon time, that they're really, they're, they're tired. And so it's really about with them uh, being able to figure out the ways in, in terms of skill, in terms of behaviors, in terms of strategies in the classroom to really ensure the fact that we can build that stamina and that grit again in terms of work completion, in terms of skills and study skills and writing and all of that. Um, so we're really pretty, I'm really pleased with what's happening in our building, um, really getting our students back in action again. 
Thank you, Mr. Brannigan. Any questions from the school committee? Rich? Um, I guess this is a question for all of you. And first of all, thank you for putting this together. It's really interesting to see the way the numbers shook out. And I think I agree with something that you would, uh, uh, I forget who said it, um, that maybe the, the specific number is, is a little less important even than the um, versus the state number. I think that's actually probably the only one that can really be looked at uh, because it was such a different year. And if I can summarize to try to figure out how I feel about it, it seems like we actually performed better versus the state uh, in most cases, uh, even than, than previous years. And so I, I would be really curious to hear um, from you folks what you think the reason for that was. Um, how did we outperform the state and or why? And um, maybe we can't know that, but um, I'd just be curious to hear some guesses, I guess, from you guys about how we did that. Slide forward. <laughs> um, one, Lisa just said it um, as well. Um, what I think is our model, and we really put together um, a virtual learning plan that kept students engaged for as long as possible um, and for a full day instead of a half day. We were in school five days a week, whether it was three days in and two days out, and a lot of other districts were two in, two out, maybe a half on Wednesday or not even in on Wednesday um, or virtual Wednesday. Um, I also think it was a lot of grit and perseverance, honestly. Um, our teachers worked harder than they've ever worked, and I felt I think we could probably say the same, <laughs> that we've worked tirelessly um, to figure out ways to make this work and support our teachers in that process of trying to pull this model together. And what was, um, I really think it was the perseverance and even from our students, just trying the best. You know, we know every home situation looks different and every house has different supports. And in middle school it looks a little different because we have what we call teenagers. They're in between being independent but not so ready to be independent for maturity reasons. And um, you know, a lot of times those students are um, responsible for taking care of younger siblings and whatnot. And I really think our teachers were very good in our guidance department. Our ESPs were an amazing team of calling home and constant contact and reaching out along with the admin team. Um, we all were under that umbrella together, working together to figure out what's the best way to support our, our students in this unusual <laughs> year and situation. And really, we, our main focus was the social emotional well being of our students came first. Um, and then we pushed away at the <coughs> academics, of course, as best we could. Um, I mean, we could make a lot of guesses, um, but I think our model had something to do with that, along with the grit and perseverance that it took the staff um, and the encouragement and motivation they gave our students to keep plugging away. And I also think our students in March, when the initial shut down, that March to June was you know, it seemed like a hot mess. I lived it through the eyes of my boys when they were juniors. Um, but once school started in September, they were kind of aware that this is how school was going to be this year. And so they knew that they really had to try and they really, grades did count and they were still being, you know, assessed and held accountable. So we all worked diligently to make that happen. And so I think it's a collective effort. And I don't know if anyone wants to add. Yeah, I think, oh, I did too. Oh. Yeah, I think it for me. I think as a as a school district, and I know all of you were so supportive of our students at the beginning, and and making sure people had the technology they needed, and the hotspots they needed, and the food that they needed. You know, kids are not ready to learn if they're not ready to learn, and to make sure that. And as a school committee, you made sure of that. You ensured that that they would have what they needed as a team, and and made sure that we had what we needed so they could have what they needed. Um, was. For me, that was amazing. You know, our, our kids got food, our kids got computers, our kids got whatever it needed, whatever they needed. We, we you know, kid, we sent home to-go bags with crayons and markers and, you know, all of those things to make sure that they had the tools that they needed to have when they were home remote learning. That's huge. That's, you know, the model was amazing. We, uh, we, we all have friends that work in other districts and no one had a model like ours. And, you know, people were saying, friends of mine and colleagues outside of the district, how did you guys make this work? You know, and again, I think you pretty much summed it up. You know, it, we all made it work because we knew what we did, what was right for our children. And that was, that, that's what we do every day. But in a case like this, thank you also for allowing us to provide for our families that, you know, you, that, that was huge for them. 
Yeah, I feel like I'm repeating a little bit, but I just wanted to make one point that I thought was really important to me and I haven't, we haven't really talked about. The whole plan from the very beginning was kid first, mm -hmm. and that was from administration, school committee, and from the teachers union. I, you know, <coughs> not judging what happens in other towns, but I know a lot of my colleagues and friends that work in other towns were struggling with plans that were rooted in staff coming up with plans that worked for them first, I think, ultimately in union negotiations. We came up with a plan that was what was best for kids and everybody agreed to that. Not that we didn't have our issues because we did. It was super challenging, but it was all about kids. Teachers were working with kids all day long. It, it was unbelievable. It really was something that I think everybody should be proud of that mm -hmm. everybody put the kids needs ahead of everything else and the sacrifice that people put in and um, coming in on Fridays when school got out, you saw teachers coming back to the school to come in mm -hmm. to plan for the rest of the week, the following week, working on weekends. I mean, it was really unbelievable. And mm -hmm. I think that's um, really should not be forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. Just one element too that I think is was really unique, but you could see the fruit of the labor that was just tremendous, is that um, this district had made a commitment that for all of our students who were fully remote, that, that the people they would see every single day were our teachers. And I think that made a significant difference uh, that you had students who, you know, when Heidi talked about the closure in March, like that was just so difficult to figure out what our kids needed because you didn't see them and to really figure out how to do that. But then when you came down to the new school year in September, there was a sense of, of real relief knowing the fact that for the many, many students whose families chose that option for their family, knowing the fact that they were going to get up every day and see a team of teachers and then watching what they were doing every single day from their homes, it was just outstanding. So I think when you look at actually just the unified front around our students, I do think that there could be some, you know, um, analysis of just really, when you talk about relationships and well-being, those became the essential core. And then once we knew that we had all of that, then learning could happen. And I think you were able to see that with what, um, you know, with what happened last year. I guess I would just close by saying <clears throat> that, that it wasn't a perfect model, um, but I think the numbers bear out and the, the administrators have uh, basically stated tonight that based on the numbers we looked at, we did better than the state average in a number of areas, most areas, and we think our model worked. Um, did it work perfectly? No. Is, is this situation still positive 100%? No, it's not. Uh, we'd rather go to masks off, we'd rather go to a regular school day, we'd rather have close our eyes and make everything go back to February, although it was snowy a little bit, but February of 2020, but um, we tried to make the best of a horrible situation and we continue to do that. So I thank the administrative team who are here tonight, Mr. Gobeil, who's not here tonight, Melanie, Dr. Melanie Gates, who's not here tonight, and certainly Carolyn Lyons, who's in the audience tonight, uh, for all of their work putting this together because it was, it was this team that put it together. Uh, and this team that made it work, um, and the team of teachers that work with us uh, for the benefit of all. So, Mr. Chair, Rich. Um, I had just two two more questions. One, I think, is a really quick one. It's probably for Mr. Lynch. Um, given, I think that it, it stands to reason that our our model and some of the ways that we went about the year seem to contribute to a better than state average um, performance on MCAS. Um, is there a, an apparatus or something that the state uses to kind of collect that feedback and, and hopefully disseminate that to the state um, that, you know, something we did here worked better than most? They have all of this data in, in, in accountability and uh, what they do with that data moving forward. I'm not sure if they do comparative data, if they'll do sort of a study back. Uh, if they do, I'm sure that we'll be part of that study because yeah. the Department of Elementary had re reached out to Middleborough, the Middleborough Public Schools, we had our model because they had heard good things about it and asked, wanted to know what made it work and how we did it. Um, and it would just, it just worked for us. We had the right amount of teachers that wanted to stay home. We had the right amount of teachers that uh, couldn't be in school. We had the right amount of teachers that, that when asked were fully remote. Um, and, uh, it, and Derek mentioned the teachers association, the teachers union. 
and Mr. Young can attest to it. They worked with us, which is a real positive thing in a lot of communities that, that we didn't get that cooperation. And if we hadn't had that cooperation, it might not have worked so well. So it was a, it was a true team effort from everyone. So excellent. I'm going to go to Greg. Greg. Yeah, please do. I just want to read a question from the chat room. Sure. Uh, said, well, let's get here. It said, Compet competency determination were waived. I believe that was for a class of 2022. Yes. Uh, can you explain what that means? Mr. Brannigan. Yeah. Um, can you just repeat that question, Mr. Stevens? I just didn't hear I, I can question. I can rephrase. Competency, dis, uh, competency determinations were waived. Right. Um, can you talk about competency de sure. determ yeah, determinations, absolutely. excuse me, and what those are? Yeah. So basically what they did is that the competency determination is based upon their MCAS scores in English and Math and Science. Um, and that their scores would dictate whether or not they're meeting the competencies to receive a diploma. And what they did is, is because of the interruptions that took place, especially in the years of, for the class of 21 and class of 22, that the competencies became based upon their courses within the school. Um, and so now what they're doing is, is that actually I have to go to a webinar tomorrow of actually working for the class of, with the class of 2022 is really, for example, a senior English class would dictate their competency. Um, passing their chemistry course potentially would satisfy the competencies. So it allows for students to be able to make sure they, in the state's eyes, that they've reached all the competencies based upon what they've done in the classroom without having the state test be part of that determination, if, I, if that answers that question. Thank you. My last one. Last one. Thank you. Um, I, looking at the, the data, uh, 2019 versus 21, it looks like on average, the younger kids did better and it, but it actually looks like it was similar in, in 2019 as well. And I was just curious if, if there's kind of a, a theory on why that, why that is, or, um, did the, you know, older kids maybe feel a little bit more of the, the pressure of what was going on than the younger kids did, or, um, just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I don't know that I have a clear answer for that. I, I think um, every age comes with different challenges and different responsibilities, and it just might have determined on what happened in their own situation, their own, you know, life. I feel like the social emotional well-being was, you know, a big concern at the middle school last year for just the high numbers. I felt was a concern, um, and you know, if students aren't if they're not ready to learn, you know, academics don't go too far. You know, the, the achievement doesn't happen. Um, it's about their social emotional well-being that comes first. I can't tell you what the discrepancy is. Usually elementary level, the kids are more excited to go to school, just from my experience. <laughs> um, you know, when you the kindergarten is coming really? off the bus and they want to hug you and say hi. And you know, on the in the middle schoolers, I don't know about the high schoolers, but I can you know, they're still asleep as they're walking in. You're lucky if you get a good morning. Um, so I just think it's just a, it's a different, you know, beast, beast depending on yeah. their adolescent age and um, what they're going through and whatever their responsibilities are. I mean, the middle schools and high school students might have more responsibilities of, of the household opposed to the elementary where mm -hmm. the parents are there in charge and overseeing and, and mm -hmm. keeping students on task or their children on task opposed to middle schools and high schools, they have to learn to be more independent and drive themselves. I just had, I mean, one thought, and just even in my own household, like my elementary daughter wasn't as impacted. Like their younger kids are not by and large as social as I think older kids. I think it just took a, maybe a little bit of a toll. I mean, this is just a guess, but took a little bit of a, you know, the, the older kids missed out on a lot. You know, not that the elementary kids didn't, but, um, you know, some some elementary kids don't even know, you know, that other people exist. They still think they're the center of the universe. And my <laughs> daughter was pretty happy at um, at home. She was she was OK. My other two, we had a really hard time with my own two kids. They were depressed. They were really upset. They had a really hard time. They had a really hard time getting back to school. And I just, you know, that would be my guess. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thank and for you for some, that. For some kids, excelled in remote in the remote That's environment. True. We do have, you know, some, you know, some of the data we can look at too is how did kids do remotely? And some kids do very did very well. My son was a senior during during COVID, and 
he did great and learned skills. He, he, he was a senior graduated in 2020 and learned some great skills from the teachers in Middleborough High School on how to be an independent learner and chose to go to college and stay remote because he, he just excelled in that environment. So for some kids, you know, not all kids suffered during this. Some kids did very well and continue to do very well. And it's different, it's different folks, different strokes for different folks sometimes, you know? Excellent, thank you. It's really, really interesting and helpful to hear um, what you guys thought about it, but thank you for everything you did to lead to this, I think, overall positive result. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, folks, appreciate it. We'll move on to my last item on my uh, report this evening. Uh, as you know, our school committee policy says that when we get new scholarships, they need to be approved by the school committee. And we have three new scholarships. Normally, Dr. Melanie Gates would be here to discuss these. She's not here for personal reasons. And, and so I'm going to read them to you, if you don't mind, the, the summary of each uh, scholarship. The first scholarship is the Emerson and Elliot Snook Memorial Scholarships. This scholarship is in memory of Kelsey Snook, who's a teacher here at Middleborough High School, and, and her husband, Zach's babies, Emerson and Elliot Snook. Um, both who are gone too soon in life. Uh, this scholarship was started by their family and friends and continued by Kelsey and Zach. Uh, Kelsey has been a special education teacher here in Middleborough High School in the Ames program since 2014. She's a leader by example who believes that every activity <coughs> should be inclusive for all students. She's an advisor of the Key Club and best buddies. It is important to Kelsey and Zach that this scholarship goes to somebody who participates in at least one extracurricular activity um, in special, in special education, uh, excuse me, or believes in inclusion for all students. This scholarship will be awarded to a graduating senior who plans to pursue a career in special education or in the medical field. They'll need to sub submit an essay at the time when they apply for the scholarship. It is a $2,500 scholarship and there's two of them available. So we thank you very much for the friends of the Snooks and the Emerson and Elliott Snook Memorial Scholarship uh, for 2022. The second scholarship this evening before you is the Swerda Family Scholarship. The Swerda Family roots in Middleborough began in 1915 when John and Eva Swerda, two immigrants from the Carpathian Mountains, married and moved into a small house on Vine Street in the west side in Middleborough. In 1922, for the total price of $150, they bought seven acres of land and a two-room house on West Grove Street. Indoor plumbing was not added till 1938. Neither John nor Eva had any formal schooling, but Eva understood the importance of an education and was determined her eight children would receive a formal education. The six youngest all earned bachelor's degrees, three in engineering, one in accounting, one in nursing, and one in bacteriology. The two oldest sacrificed their education and careers to help out at home. Education and hard work were the foundation of the family, and we give this scholarship to students of need who embody these two family values. Applicants should be a senior in high school, be in the top 30% of their graduating class, have a college or university application of accepted attending, and a major in one of the following subcategories, accounting, architecture, biology, computer and information sciences, uh, engineering, geology, or nursing. Recipient must maintain at least a 3.0 GPA in college and would receive a $5,000 check in a scholarship. The third scholarship is the Alma B. Wilbur Memorial Scholarship. This scholarship is in memory of um, Alma B. Wilbur, a longtime first grade teacher in the Middleborough Public School. This is to be awarded to a graduating senior of Middleborough High School who will be pursuing a degree in education. Priority will be given to a student that demonstrates financial need. Upon successful completion of their first semester, awardees must submit both an official transcript and a copy of the next semester's bill. Awardees must maintain good academic standing. The award check will be made out to the college or university. And this is one scholarship available uh, for each year at thousand dollars. So those are the three scholarships before you this evening that need to be approved if they are to be included in the scholarship package for graduating seniors. Chair, I entertain a motion to approve the scholarships. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? Other than thank you to those people for creating the scholarships and we thank Dr. Gates for her hard work in getting it done. Thanks, and thank you to Dollars for Scholars in Middleborough, a very active group that uh, handles a lot of scholarships. And anyone out there who wants to think about forming a scholarship in somebody's memory um, can certainly do that. And uh, they can certainly reach out to me if they'd like. And I can point them in the right direction. Any further discussion? Right. Sure. Just wanted to mirror what you said. This is incredibly generous uh, of you know, these three three awards. And just a thanks from, from us and from the community to these folks. Any further discussion? 
Is there any none of those in favor say aye? aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch. Um, next up is the second read of the policy KF and KFR, which are community use of grounds and facilities and community use of school facilities. Is there any discussion about those? Because there's been no changes other than I know Rich, you handed out the list of what was changed. Yeah, and, and Mr. Chair, I just wanted to note that um, if if you look in your Dropbox, you'll see there's a Word doc in there, and I, I just left uh, track changes on it, so you could see in the right column there what what had been changed. And um, but like I mentioned at the last one, there for the most part, most of the changes, and and Meg knows obviously we you know we worked on this together along with Tara and a bunch of others. Uh, most of the changes were um, in the fee schedule um, that we were charging versus other towns for our facilities. Any further discussion? Chairman, to attend a motion to approve the second reading. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, and I'll be at the next meeting for the third and final reading. Um, letter to Desi. Um, I had sent that to everybody. Did anyone have any questions or comments on the final letter that I sent out to everybody? Good, Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I read the letter. I, I think it expressed all of my concerns. Okay. And Ms. Kearns, thank you. I apologize. I just saw that my note back to you is still in draft. It was never sent. I did include the questions that you had asked. Are we going to be able to hear what the letter is today or? Um, I sent the letter to the committee, so once they approve it, we'll put it up on the website. Okay, you'll put it up, so not tonight. We don't get to hear what you're... Right, what you're... I, I just finished it to putting everything together today and sent it out to the committee. Okay. And okay. I can send you a copy afterwards. That would be wonderful. I'd appreciate that. No Thank problem. You. I appreciate it. Any comments or questions? Um, Chair, we entertain a motion to approve the letter since it is from the committee. So moved. Do second. second. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Um, MSBA, Middle High School Building Project. Um, we had a meeting last week. Yeah, a meeting meeting last week of the building committee, yes. And when will the parking lot be done again? Uh, the parking lot is scheduled for paving the 27th, 28th, 29th of October, possibly the 30th. And then striping on <coughs> November, November 3rd. Sean, you can, if you're near Mike and I'd say anything incorrect, let me know. Um, he was in the owner's architect construction meeting with me today. The striping, I believe, the lining of the parking lot will be November 3rd. Um, they have finished most of the landscaping. They're just about done with the landscaping bit. Um, they're widening the opening. Um, when we looked at the opening uh, on the design phase, it's hard to see what it's going to end up looking like. And it looked a little tight, so we talked to the fire department. We had the bus company <coughs> go up in the fire department. Uh, and though even if it's 12 and a half feet wide or so, uh, it's going to be widened to about 15 feet at this point, with not not a lot of additional money involved. But it, it's, this is the time to change it before we pave um, and cut the cut the granite curbing down just a little bit, move push that curb back, so we have 15 feet, so we can swing a ladder truck in or or a full bus. <coughs> And other communities have slightly longer buses in some instances, so we want to be accommodating, certainly. So that was a, a major change today. Um, tell me out, Sean, if there's anything else that came up today in that meeting that's a surprise. We continue to work on the gym floor. That's almost near uh, near back to where it should be. Uh, and we're starting to use that again uh, for volleyball in gym classes. <coughs> Help me yeah. out, Sean. Anything else? <laughs> I, think, I think that was pretty much it. Uh, one of the big changes was, and I talked a little bit about it last meeting, about pushing the opening of that parking lot until phase six is almost complete. So they don't want to be, they don't want to pave that parking lot and then be bringing sod over to the softball field, bringing backhoes over to the softball field. Um, so they're going to leave the rough grade, get all that done. They're planning on sodding next week. I believe they're going to have 11 guys here. Um, so they're going to get try and get that field done, then have the final pave done so that they're not causing destruction to right. – they don't want to redo it really, is, and we don't blame them. So so that JV uh, softball team will be sodded, I believe he said, next Thursday. 
Um, it's supposed to be a little bit of a wet week, so I hope that it's not too wet. But they, I know they had the, the grater and the steamroller out there on today packing it down, so hopefully it's not uh, affected too much by mud. And they're out there right now doing uh, finishing up the electrical for the lights, and also uh, we have Signet on, on site running the cameras. There's a lot of cameras out in that parking lot, so it's kind of a lot of a lot of wiring going on out there. But and there were five lights that were supposed to be sort of double lights like this, and they ended up coming single lights. So they ordered the five. They're waiting for those. In the meantime, they're going to put up the single lights, so there'll be adequate lighting. So the project is at about 95 percent completion. About yes. And we are still very much under budget, and we've only spent about less than 50 percent of the contingency budget. We're just about there. And so, the, the yeah. tennis court and the, the other fields will be finished in the spring. So any questions about that? Great. Um, MASC, MASS uh, convention, just a reminder that that is virtual, um, but um, a limited number will be going in person and I will be there in person. So I just got word the other day. Um, Chair, I understand a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion? Um, yes. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to, uh, you, you may have been planning to do this already, but I just wanted to mention one of the items in the consent agenda, uh, just because a, a parent specifically asked me about it. Um, the trunk or treat um, event um, is going to be, from what I remember, on the 31st, and it's going to be run by high school students um, to give town townspeople something to go enjoy for Halloween. Um, I think we may have heard some specifics in a past meeting on this, but if not, maybe there they could go up on the website or something like that. Uh, they, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, this was done last year. Oh. That event's 12 to 2 on the 31st. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none of those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Um, and with that, Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Our next meeting is November 18th. Thank you very much, everybody.